So today we have Jorgen Runners that is giving this talk from, from Norway. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people that helped me out to set this thing up because it came basically as a, an idea a couple of months ago. We started advertising a couple of weeks ago and very quickly we end up having interest from more than 300 people joining between here and uh, online from different places. So the, the first people I'd like to thank are Synergy. Uh, we have here the Deputy Director, Sergei Kolesnikov. Uh, Synergy is an interdisciplinary research institute uh, at the Department of Land Economy in Cambridge. They focus on uh, policy, energy policy, environment, and natural resource governance. I'd like to thank a lot the Club of Rome that uh, decided to support us with this, uh, with this idea of the seminar series. Of course, these links a lot with them in the sense that they recently published these books and they are as keen as possible to advertise them as much as possible to spread the message. I'd like to thank the Bennett Institute for Pu Public Policy that also uh, is very keen on this type of research and decided to support us as well. And the Global Sustainability Institute at Angla Rask University. And, uh, and, and that's of course in line with this type of research. Uh, now, before going into detail of the presentation of Jorgen Randers, what I'd like to do is to remember people of the seminars that are coming for the next weeks, because this thing has been structured pretty, let's say, strongly uh, over seven weeks periods. And uh, next week, we're going to have Ga Gaia Errington. And uh, you will hear in a little while as well some inputs from Yoga Runners on the work of Gaia. Then we're going to have basically a bit of more technical, followed by less technical, more qualitative type of things. So on the following week will be Julia Kim looking at the measuring of progress. Uh, and we'll discuss that, there's a lot of research in that area. Then we go back to a bit more technical with Ugo Bardi looking at the world models in general, story on that kind. Then we go to Manfela Ranfele, who he is uh, one of the founder of the, of the Nelson Mandela Foundation in South Africa, also candidate prime minister in South Africa. She did amazing thing and she's co-president of the Club of Rome. And basically, she's going to talk a little bit more about the, the, the component of humanity, so how people will really do the change. Then there is a seminar by myself, looking at the, basically, a bit more technical again, looking at the financial sector, how this global model links to that. And then Jayati Ghosh, that is also one of the lead authors of the, this book that you can find there, Heard for All. Uh, and she's going to conclude, let's say, the seminar series with probably the main message we're going to uh, look at with the book. Now, I just want to invite very quickly Professor Yanders that is uh, there with us. Uh, Professor Yanders, can you please say a few words by yourself? Just saying hi, people are looking at you in the big screen. Well, I am absolutely delighted to be able to open this uh, lecture series celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the limits to growth. This means that I personally have spent 50 years trying to save the world. And in vain, I would add, I've spent one third of my life in academia, one third of my life in business, and one third of my life in politics and NGO. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, later on to be able to present my message and to hear uh, your comments and answer your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Anders. We will be due in five minutes. Uh, so, of course, Professor Anders have done a huge amount of work. Uh, now, before the start of his talk, what I want to say is a bit of story, just to give a bit of background information about what this is all about. So you might have heard about the limits to growth. That's probably why you're all here. Uh, but I just wanted to say that the limits to growth didn't start from scratches. So there was somebody building on it. So in the 1970, that came from basically the Club of Rome. So that was funded uh, in 1970, just to look at this big problem that what they call the predicament of mankind. It became a report. Uh, they funded the, the Club of Rome. They went to talk to this professor and the MIT, Jay Forrester, and asked him, please help us. What can you provide us in terms of computer modeling and things to help us doing this stuff? 
So what it happened was that Professor Forrester looked at uh, the, this beast predicament of mankind and built a computer model very quickly back uh, to, the, to the America in like a couple of weeks, no more than that. Very uh, big sketch in the computer and called that thing World 2. It was basically the first attempt to build a world model ever done in 1971. And look at this big challenge of sustainability. You can find that in World Dynamics, it was published in 1971. And on top of that, the Club of Rome decided it was good to invest in it and uh, basically fund the project. And that's where the, the limits of growth came to be, in the sense that uh, on the one side here, you have, you have the entire team of the limits of growth. Uh, so the limits of growth became super famous. They sold 12 million copies worldwide. They published it in 1972, all the language possible. Uh, they, the model from World II became World III. You, the dynamics of growth and effective world is the technical report linked with that in 1974. They were uh, famous because of this big problem of growth linking to collapse of the economy. Of course, they became very, very important. And Professor Anderson will speak more about that. What happened after that in 1992 and uh, 2003, they, they updated this model together with Dennis Meadows and Bianca Randers and Daniela Meadows. They called this thing Beyond the Limits, the Limits to Growth 30 Years Update. The, the scenario was updated accordingly. The last one, for example, one is the, the many scenario where despite all the technology we can build in our world, this, during 2030, 2060, we might end up in a food crisis, no matter what. And that's actually a positive scenario. So you think it or not, that's a positive one. And uh, uh, again, 10 years later, Professor Anders took the lead for building a new completely model, they call it or two, and that was became the 2052 book. So global forecast for the next 40 years. Uh, it was a tremendous piece of work, it was sold all over the places, thousands and thousands of copies in China in particular. May I say a bit more, Professor Anders read about that. Uh, then they update the model in Earth 3. Uh, transformation is feasible, work with uh Johan Rockstrom, I think many of you might know about him as well. And that was updated further. The Earth 3 became Earth 4, and then they was, was called Earth for All. It was actually a very good way to, to present that. So, and that's all I want to say for now. Now, in order to uh, avoid technical problems that might happen every time we do online things, Professor Anders sent a video. So we are gonna have about 40 minutes looking at this video which is a presentation I did. Uh, and then after that, we were going to uh, to have question and answer with Professor Anders. So, uh, good vision. I am the most depressed 77 year old person you are likely to meet. But since I've given this talk for 50 years, I've learned that if I have a smiling face, you know, the whole thing works much better. You know, then you clap and you're enthusiastic afterwards. Although in reality, I am really depressed after having tried for 50 years in vain to get the world to move in a sustainable direction. And then we go. 50 years ago, my friends and I wrote a small book called The Limits to Growth. This book warned about overshoot and collapse at the global level. It presented 12 scenarios for the world from 1970 to the year 2100. Six of those scenarios were sad scenarios where something went wrong in the 21st century. Either there were too many people or too little resources or too little food or too much pollution. And six of the scenarios were scenarios where humanity managed to organize a certain degree of sustainability in its affairs, you know, so that you didn't get the overshoot and collapse uh, phenomenon. The book did not predict the future. It didn't say what will happen, because that was at the time scientifically impossible with the amount of understanding we had of social systems at the time. So all we could do at the time was to advise the world against the obviously sad scenarios, the overshoot and collapse scenarios, and then say, why don't you try to pursue sustainability? We didn't call it sustainability at the time. We called it equilibrium or no growth, things like this. 
But sustainability came 20 years later as the label. What did we recommend? We simply said, mankind, please remember that you are living on a finite globe. So please organize your lives so that you do not conflict with this totally obvious fact that we cannot have an endless number of people and we cannot have endless amount of physical resource use uh, per person. So what has happened since? The world has essentially followed its normal path, namely the average of all of those scenarios we made. And recently there is a lady who has done science on this. So she has taken the four most important scenarios in the 1972 book and compared it with what has actually happened. So the colored ones uh, are four of the scenarios. There are two sad scenarios and two positive scenarios. And the black dot, this is for the population development towards 2100. The black dots shows what has actually happened. And you can see on this graph that uh, the world population has essentially followed what we stated 50 years ago. Uh, you can do the same thing with industrial output, which is the closest we get in the model to the real GDP. And again, you see that the world has followed essentially the average of those four scenarios. You can do the same thing with slightly more exotic concepts, namely well-being. So that this is the Human Development Index, if some of you know this. And you see the very interesting fact that, yes, well-being, average global well-being has been going up during the last 30 to 40 years. But you are seeing a leveling off of the well-being development. The dotted, the black line is starting to flatten out, just like in the limits to growth uh, main scenarios. So in summary, Yes, the world hasn't reacted very strongly to the limits to growth message. At least the first 50 years is tracking essentially the main core of the scenarios. The second conclusion you can draw is that we have grown into overshoot. What you can conclude from what we have seen over the last 50 years is that we have not run into resource limits. You know, we have not run out of coal, we have not run out of oil, we have not run out of gas. And there are, we have not run out of agricultural land. We, you know, many of the limits in the limits to growth has not been exceeded to the extent that this is a global affair. The only where area where we really have overshot is in the area of climate. We are every year now emitting twice as much CO2 into the atmosphere as is being absorbed in the oceans and the forests of the world during that year. So this remaining half, you know, sits in the atmosphere. And the, as the years go by, more and more and more of this thing is accumulating in the atmosphere. The concentration of CO2 rises and the temperature, you know, gets higher and higher. And we'll continue to do so, not only until we stop emitting uh, CO2, but we have to suck out you know, the CO2 that is already added. The third conclusion from looking at the last 50 years is that we have had no collapse. You know, so the curves are going up, but we haven't seen yet, you know, a rapid decline in the population or a rapid decline in anything else. And fourthly, we have seen some positive developments during these last 50 years. For instance, the number of children per woman in the world has declined on average from three and a half to two and a half. And as a consequence, the population bomb has been stopped. The world population will peak around nine billion people in another 30 years. Uh, and so the population problem has been solved. Also in the area of energy, energy efficiency has increased tremendously during the last uh, 50 years. And you have also positive developments in popular attitudes. You know, more people at this point in time are interested in green issues than 50 years ago. And perhaps as important, institutional development. So at least there is some positive uh, developments. But what is 
in some the current situation. Well, the current situation is that in the rich world, the most serious problem is climate. And if you look at most of the world, namely the six billion people that do not live uh, among us, poverty remains the problem. So we have two problems at this point in time, climate and poverty, global poverty. This graph is interesting because it shows the annual emissions of CO2. And you may notice, or you will not notice, that it, we have no spoken about stopping the growth in annual emissions for 30 years. The IPCC was you know, the, established in 1988. And one should have assumed that since its sole purpose is to get this curve to level off and go down, you know, one should have been able after 30 years to see some indication that this is not continuing growth. It is still going up as we are speaking and as we're running the umpteenth COP, you know. So there is a lot of talk and absolutely no visible effect on global emissions at this point in time. Yes, European emissions are going down slightly, but of course compensated for by increased emissions in China, who has taken over the production that we're just outsourcing. So this is Really, it doesn't work. Uh, the next question then is, so we have overshot. We have not yet seen collapse. We see that the climate sector is where, you know, the limits to growth thesis is being tested most clearly. So you can ask the question, what is going to happen during the next 50 years? Uh, and... Uh, what we did three years ago when we started planning for the 50-year uh, anniversary book, which is called Earth for All, uh, is essentially to say that we are observing that human well-being is leveling off. We fear that it is going to continue down. So we decided to make a study of human well-being during the next 50 years. And so we did, and as Tony again said, you know, three, two weeks ago, we published the German version of this report. It is already in the fourth printing. They have printed 30,000 copies in two weeks. So luckily, it seems that we managed to get through, and I'll tell you later why we got through, how we got through. Uh, and the American one came yesterday, I think, uh, 20th of September, that's perhaps two days ago. And so we are in the early stage of trying to send our new message uh, to the world. This, uh, uh, this study of well-being is deliberately the head label instead of GDP growth. We're aiming for a society that tries to grow well-being. And in order to do this in a proper manner, here is the definition of well-being that we have ended up using. So we're looking at well-being as consisting of five components. The first component is the disposable income after tax. The second one is the amount of public services available. The third one is the level of inequality in society. And the fourth one is observed damage. You know, it's the observed global warming. And the fourth one, the fifth one, is what we call perceived progress, capturing the fact that if you have a society where well-being is going up, the mood and the political support to strong governments is much better than if you have a society where well-being is going down, where people start to worry about the future and start to do all the negative things that happens when there is no perceived progress. So this is our composite indicator, which we use as the performance indicator in our study. Most other people who build formal models use GDP as the goal. 
you know, because they say that total production of goods and services, you know, if it goes up, it's good. If it goes down, it's bad. We say that that is not true. It is the well-being of people that matters, not the GDP. We have built an impressive model, which certainly is not visible on this screen, and there is no need for you. This is just to brag. You know. This is just to show that this is an enormous amount of work, enormous amount of data. The only thing it does, it makes us sure that we present consistent scenarios, pictures where we do think about the effect if you tax the rich, the fact that they then have less money to invest. You know, we take this into account. You know, so that uh, you don't dream like most sustainability researchers do, you know, in some way or the other. Fine. Uh, what happens? So this is the future in the situation where there is no extraordinary action. So as our base run, we look at what do we think are the consequences over the next 50 years if decision-making is done in the same style as during the last 40 years? So this is not... So in the system, decisions concerning family size are endogenous in the sense that they choose to have the number of children which the conditions in the model system says or indicates you know, at future, the societal reaction to pollution is dependent on the level of the pollution in the system at the future point in time. So think nothing is locked up. This is, you know, a, a model, endogenous, fully endogenous, except for some technological advance, uh, that calculates its way into the future. And so we believe that these are much less unreliable models than most models, which are either business as usual models or assuming a certain uh, policy change. Uh, so what happens in this run? You look at the, the top, the, the thing goes from 1980 to 2100. The red line is the global population, which starts, you know, passes the 6 billion mark in the year 2000, passes the 7.8 billion, that is the current pop, uh, 2020 population, and then it peaks uh, around 2050. Why does it peak? It peaks because women in the model system have gotten sufficiently affluent that they choose to have fewer children rather than uh, and go going to job instead. Life expectancy is of course going up all the time, reducing the number of deaths, but still the balance comes out so that we get a peak in the population around uh, 9 billion people in 2050. If you look at the blue line, the blue line is the GDP per person. This is the indicator that all economists are interested. In our view, the GDP growth is going to continue through the century, uh, relatively unaffected and more or less at the same growth rate as uh, observed in the past. Uh, the structural composition, for those of you who are economists, will shift, you know, we will shift from a dirty fossil-based ec uh, economy towards a green, renewable-based uh, economy aiming for, for uh, well-being instead of aiming for increased, uh, rapidly increasing GDP. If you look at uh, the sad things, you can see there is a solid line going up. This is the average temperature. So this is the global warming, and you see it starts from a low value in 1980, it passes through the plus one degree centigrade in 2020, and it levels off around two and a half degrees centigrade at the end of the century. So our business as usual um, forecast is that we will actually blast through the plus one and a half degrees, we will blast through the two degrees, and we will then finally stop this madhouse at the end of the century at plus two and a half degrees centigrade. You can also see another gray line, which is inequality. This is the income of the richest 10% after tax divided by the income of the 90% poorest after tax. And you see that this inequality is increasing throughout the, the run because this is an inherent uh, as the characteristic of capitalist societies 
of the type that dominate the world, where wealth you know, tends to concentrate on fewer and fewer hands as long as you maintain competition and all the things that is the dream of democratic market economies. Uh, the sum is the green line, which is the well-being index, and you see it increases, has been increasing over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years with the big business cycle swings, uh, and then it starts at decline, you know, towards the middle of this century, 2060, and then it stays low throughout. And there is no mystery in this, you know. So uh, the income is going up, social services are, are going up, but the climate is getting warmer and inequality is getting worse and worse. And so the sum total of this is a well-being that declines. And as it declines, the hope for the future declines. And so it further declines. And then what happens in a model system is local social collapse. You don't get collapse because of environmental reasons and not at the global level, but you do get national breakdown, basically, when people really get pissed off. And so that is, this is the future. We call it too little, too late. All the young researchers in the project say that we are easily going to pass the political decisions necessary in order to solve this problem. I am 77 and a depressed man, so I say this is not going to be easy, but we should still try. So let's see what it takes you know, to make well-being in the model system not go down, but you know, perhaps increase a little bit further in this uh, century. For those of you who know, see in front of you a technocrat whom you do not trust. You know, I've put in a small paragraph for you because you, at this point in time, would like to say, Dr. Anders, even with your competence and with your arrogance, you know, is it possible to make a mathematical model that says something of importance or significance about the next 50 years? And my answer is contrary to most model builders in the world and contrary to most economists of the world, a resounding yes. It is possible to say more than nothing. What you can say something about are trends. It is not possible to predict events at particular things in the future, but you can say something about trends. Why? The reason is that if you start looking at data in a proper manner, you can find stable relationships between human behavior and the income level. The one which is behind the clouds here shows the GDP per person along the horizontal axis and the energy use in physical units, million tons of oil equivalent per person per year. And all the thin lines are the various regions of the world over the last 40 years. And although the precision is not very high, you see that as when you start as poor, you use little energy. And then as you get richer, you use more and more energy. But for those of you who doubt the Kuznets curve, you know, notice in the United States of America, the, one of the richest economies, the per capita consumption of energy has been stable for the last 40 years. And in my country, which is the stinking richest country on the surface of the earth, with, you know, we produce more hydropower and more oil and gas than you know, is ethical, decent, etc., etc. In our households, the electricity use per family has been going down for the last 20 years. Why? Because we introduce heat pumps, which are efficient, you know, and so the, the important point is that energy use does per person does actually stabilize when you get into the $30,000 uh, per person per year, approximately the level of Finland, meaning that you're getting close now to the point where energy use per person no longer increases, if measured not in dollars, but in physical units. So, I've tried to convince you that 
This is the too little, too late uh, scenario. And you can start, and I said that the basis for making forecasts like this is simply heroic assumptions put into a system, and then you try to see what is a consistent uh, you know, uh, future. What should be done? So I'm telling you that the most, if we don't do anything particular, uh, well-being is actually going to decline on average in the world over the next uh, 50 years. So what should be done? And that's, of course, the main topic of the new book, the Earth for All book. In my mind, what we're doing, we, are pro we have discussed back and forth what are the five most important actions that humanity should put in place if they want well-being, you know, to l not go down, ideally level off or, uh, or go a little bit up. And these we call turnarounds, just to have a label that people might remember. So we are discussing uh, and arguing in favor of five extraordinary uh, actions uh, uh, for humanity. And the first one is poverty, the poverty turnaround. This is to make sure that all poor nations on the surface of the earth actually reaches a GDP of $15,000 per person per year. You know, India is at four, Africa south of Sahara is at two. You know, so there is a huge job of good old-fashioned economic development that needs to take place in the poor end of the spectrum. Maximum old-fashioned growth you know, and the growth in material consumption and growth in everything else in order to remove undignified poverty that has existed, you know, for a much, much too many years. And mind you, you know, the rich population is 2 billion. The poor population, the one that are below 15,000, is 6 billion. So for three, four, three quarters of the world population, the climate issue is much less important than poverty. And that's the reason why the poverty turnaround is at the top. How does one achieve rapid economic growth in the third world? The only thing we say publicly, and then I'll say afterwards what I say privately, in order to... So publicly we say that we cannot continue to use the development methods that we have been pushing for the last 50 years because they don't work. What have we tried to push on to the third world over the last 40 years? It's, of course, the Washington Consensus, the World Bank type of solution, public austerity, you know, free competition, illegal to support infant industries, you know, all those things that makes it absolutely certain that a poor country cannot develop has been the textbook. So the point is that we have to throw out the Washington Consensus, and that means throwing out the market solution, and that means supporting strong government. All of these things is, of course, to bomb the So we say in Norwegian, what does is this is in English? I don't know. And so it is heresy, you know, what we are presenting under point number one. Personally, since I have been working for the Chinese over the last 10 years, the Chinese have eight doubled the GDP per person for 1.3 billion people in the last 40 years. So at least there exists on the surface of the earth techniques that is capable of doing what needs to be done for the 6 billion remaining poor people. Yes, I know at once when I say I like China, you know, people stop listening because they think Uyghurs, Hong Kong, Spratly Islands. And it's impossible to get a meaningful discussion. And so my colleagues never mention China in this context. They say, look to Costa Rica, you know, which is another way. And I would say, look to Sweden and Norway, particularly from 1945 to 1965, a period where 200 gentlemen in Oslo made all the decisions on behalf of the people and built the welfare state of Norway in those 20 years before the right-wing parties took over in 1965, you know, and you know, slowed down the, the real move towards a 
collective and, and the egalitarian society. The second one is the inequality thing. That's very simple. It's take from the rich and give to the poor. So this is just transfer legislation that you know, mandates. Uh, empowerment is the third one, which is also very simple. We know from the past 50 years that if you make available to everyone, education, health, contraception, and opportunity, you know, then the women very, very quickly rise to decent positions and choose to have a job rather than having children at all. So this is, uh, so the empowerment one is very important, both because of human rights issues and egalitarian and fairness issues, but also because it really solves the underlying problem of population growth. Food, we, you know, survive well, we produce in the world more than enough food to feed everyone a decent diet, even at the current level. The art, the problem is that this way of running agriculture destroys biodiversity in, in the process. So we need, and it also leads to 15% of the climate problem, so we need just to change agricultural and forestry procedures so that they get more climate friendly. And the fifth thing we have already spoken about, that's the energy sector. There's only one thing we need to do, and that is to phase out the use of coal, oil, and gas and replace with renewable energy uh, and energy efficiency and carbon capture and storage. So the final thing I add, because when you do the calculations, you can see that it is not enough only to move the world to wind and sun and introduce maximum electrification, you actually need to, buy, to capture some of the carbon that comes from the industrial use of heat in order to make the world come up plus two and a half degrees centigrade at the end of the century. If you don't use the CCS, you end up at three. You know, so it's, uh, this is what is called net negative emissions in the, in the lingo. So these are the five TAs. What do they cost? You know, because since it's, it's so obvious what needs to be done, why has it not happened? Of course, it hasn't happened because this is slightly more expensive than doing nothing. And it also has the side effect that you lose jobs in the dirty sector before you get the green jobs. And so people fear this thing because that it threatens their income. Uh, the cost of doing this, we estimate, along with others who have tried to estimate this, at between 2 and 4 percent of global income. And what it amounts to is essentially to taking 2 to 4 percent of the labor and the real capital of the world, shifting it from dirty production to green production. So in clear talk, it means to take the Vatsila yard workers, you know, or sorry, the easier to talk about Norwegian yard workers who are currently producing oil platforms and diesel uh, ships and just ask them to produce floating platforms with windmills. The same equipment and the same talent. And this is what the shift from a dirty economy, fossil driven, GDP oriented thing to a sustainable one amounts to on the ground. It's simply a shift of workforce from dirty activity, unsustainable activity, to sustainable activity. And the amount is surprisingly small. You know, it's a few percent of the total income, which means that it is not difficult to ask the rich to pay. Because the 10% richest in the world control 50% of global income. So if you want them to pay 2 to 4%, it means that you need to add to their income tax roughly 5 percentage points. And that's what it takes. So tax the rich, give the money to the government, who then pays people to create a sustainable future for the majority. The good thing is that the five turnarounds, if they're implemented in a timely fashion in the Earth for All model, does actually generate the giant leap scenario where human well-being does indeed continue to rise during the 21st century.
And most people hate taxes, and they hate the state, and they hate regulations. And consequently, there is no way a democracy is capable of making the necessary decisions. I'll take the two last points. Uh, so what, what is this? What does it amount to? So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, this amounts to a transformation of modern economies from economies that use fossil energy in order to increase the GDP, the value of annual production of goods and services as fast as possible, to an economy which uses labor and capital to increase the well-being of the masses instead. So it's a, a transformation. It's not, you don't need to throw out the system. You just need to, as I said, you know, shift. This is a structural shift from dirty to clean uh, activity. The problem is that this is not profitable from the business point of view. You know, so shifting the worker from doing the dirty job where there is a high labor productivity, high income per man year, into one of the green things where the income is much lower. You know, if they, it had been higher, you know, then the capitalists of the world very quickly would have invested in these things. They don't. And we know uh, from 40 years that they're pretending that they're doing this and the banks are now greenwashing themselves and everyone is doing all the, luckily I've, I've been the chairman of three banks in my life, so I know this, and I have sat on the Sustainability Council of three horrible multinationals for 15 years. Dow Chemical in, in the United States, British Telecom in London, and AstraZeneca, which is somewhat closer to, to home. And just to see you know, what one is doing on the inside is very helpful. Then at least you understand what's going on and can call a spade a spade if you don't get your salary from them. So we need to shift investments from dirty activity, coal, oil and gas, into other things. But it is not profitable to do so, so the market will never put sufficient income. So how do you do it instead? You take the money from the rich. And then you invest it, the government invests it in non-profitable activity, which helps the world, instead of having them invest it in things that makes the problem bigger. It is collective action that is necessary, in my mind. Voluntary individual action does not suffice. The free market will not do this. What is the fundamental challenge? at this point in time, for sustainability workers and for everyone else? Well, it is to establish political support, public support, democratic support for higher taxes and more regulation. This is what is needed in order to solve the sustainability problem. And as I've said before, if there is one thing that people hate, it is higher taxes and more regulation. So in a democratic society, it is not possible to get this to happen. And consequently, one becomes a pessimist like me, with a smiling face in order to entertain you. The next question then, if the challenge really is to, you know, get political support for something which is not liked. Is there any way in which you could do this? And the answer is luckily, yes. If you make sure that the people don't get a bill, you know, then it is more likely that they would be in favor of this shift. And if you also compensated those people that lose their job while they are finding a green job, you pay their full salary, the state pays the full salary, you know, then it is conceivable that you could do something. So then comes the question, is there any way in which the state could finance the system, the, the shift, the transformation in such a way that they do not send a bill, a tax bill, to the voter? 
because then you might have a winning platform. You know, you could get a lot of votes for this type of platform. So then you must ask the question, how can governments finance sustainability action? How can they finance the five turnarounds? And there are three ways. There is more taxes, borrowing, or printing money. Higher taxes is impossible if you want to have a democratic majority, but that's where we end up saying, if you tax the 10% richest only, and we know that they can afford it, you know, then you should get a democratic majority to support this thing. Of course, in the United States of America, which I love, I've lived in the United States and got my education there, but I love the America that existed in 1970, not the America that exists now. In the United States of America, there is no way you will ever get support for a strong government, a majority support. So the United States, in our book and in my mind, is lost. You know, they are on the peak. They were on the peak 10 years ago, and they're now gradually going to decline while China rises as the superpower of, of the world. The second way of doing this is borrowing. Who do you then borrow from? And that's where it is very important to always, in your mind, split the population in two groups. It's the owners and the workers, the rich and the poor. What is a worker? A worker is a person who spends most of his income every year. So there's only a tiny little difference. So when you borrow from someone, do, who do you borrow from? Of course, from the rich. So borrowing is the same as getting some money from the rich and pay the person interest rates back. And where do you get the interest rate? From the poor. So Solving this through borrowing like the COVID thing did, you know, is yet another way of increasing inequality in society. So number two, borrowing is not a good idea in addition to the fact that you know this is postponing the bill to future generations. This is just like your nuclear plant, you know, where you dig down the, um, the residue and assume that you know, 10,000 years from now, they will be happily still watching your repository. And then comes the final way of doing this, and that's to print money. So, of course, one could instruct the central bank to print an additional 2% of the national income, earmark the money for green activity, so that it is being used to pay directly on the ground the guy who's building the windmill, or the girl who is making the solar panel, or the whatever who is tending to the old, you know, in a non-profitable uh, situation. This I am not allowed to say, because people get so angry when you speak about China, that if you also talk about the fact that it's very easy for a country that has its own currency, so Finland is out, but for a country that has its own currency to just print exactly the amount of money that is necessary in order to solve whatever problem uh, they want. Of course, modern industrial societies have legislation in the book that ensures that central banks don't do this. So it requires tremendous legislation change to change the goal of the central bank, and we know that this is going to take 30 years, you know, to get this to happen. And so we're back to the simple solution, and then I'll read it loud, and that is the end. Uh, the world has a problem. The prospect of declining well-being in the decades ahead, caused by global warming and rising inequality. The problem can be solved but it will require five extraordinary turnarounds paid for by the 10% richest in order to be politically feasible. And finally, what should you do? You should reduce your ecological footprint and support an active and well-funded state, or somewhat more briefly, so you can put it up on a banner, electrify and vote for a red-green party.
Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay, I'll stop now the sharing because it's no longer needed. Uh, a lot of people put questions in the in the chat, so I would suggest to start from those. So first of all, uh, Professor Anders, I'd like to ask some questions about your opinions. From Daniel Schwartz. Uh, so I saw the chat myself and what it actually asked was the question of whether I have changed my mind since I wrote uh, 2052, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and the answer is uh, not really, in the sense that 10 years ago, I believed, I for the first time, said loudly that I do not think that humanity will rise to the occasion. I do not think that one would act strong enough on the climate side to avoid uh, warming to exceed the Paris limit. I also said that I do not think that Western uh, liberal society is going to change their way of development aid in such a manner that it actually will increase uh, the, sig significantly the GDP per person uh, of the global south. Uh, so what, and I also at that point in time believed that China was going to continue its rise, doubling the GDP per person another time over the next 10 years. And I said that I thought that the United States was going to stagnate. And so all of those things have come true in my mind during those 10 years. So I have not significantly changed my mind. The reason why I am still at it is that my younger colleagues have told me that there is not much help in telling people that the world is going to hell. You know, you should come up with a positive solution, something that people can do. And that's what we have done. I've done, I've written three other books since uh, the 2052. All of them include solutions that all have been rejected by the audience. But at least here we go again. So the, we're now recommending the five turnarounds as the obvious things that ought to take place. So that's new. In the 2052 book, there was not five solutions. The next question I think is kind of linked with that. Uh, again, looking at the type of collapse. So that was from Arum Fais. It was like uh, both Dennis Meadows and uh, Hugo Bardi said the collapse will be global rather than regional. Can you say something about global versus regional collapse? I can say that uh, my dear friend and boss, Dennis Meadows, who is a full three years older than I and has always been three years older than me and always the boss, he and I have disagreed on this matter for the last uh, 25 to 30 years. Uh, you know, 20 to 25 years ago, I changed from believing that resource constraints would be the most serious ones to believing that emissions constraints, namely the climate problem, which is an emissions problem, pollution problem, is more important than, uh, the, uh, uh, than the resource constraint. And so we intelligently disagree uh, on this matter. Uh, and we also disagree on the idea of whether the collapse will be global in the sense that it occurs at the same time for the same reason all over the world, or whether it will be a more gradual evolution, you know, where things go wrong for some reason in one area and for other reasons in other areas. And in third reasons, it doesn't go wrong at all until a generation after they had the first collapses. And the, you can think yourself about what are all the arguments for uh, in favor of Dennis and Hugo's view, who says that the world is tightly connected and there is no way you know, someone can go down the drain without pulling most of the people along with them. My view is much more cynical. It is the sense that, you know, if, uh, you know, that, that I believe 
that the regions will prove able to defend the quality of life in their territories. And I think that I am being supported by the ugly behavior of the Europeans over the last decade. You know, we have no done exactly what I said in 2052. We have put up machine guns basically around the perimeter, around Europe, you know, in order to keep others out so that we are able to maintain a higher quality of living uh, in Europe. I'm not saying that that's, you know, ethical or nice behavior, but it is the type of thing that people will do in my mind in the future. Uh, and consequently, they will postpone their collapses longer. So that's the reason why I currently basically say that yes, the climate collapse, if it had come, would have been global, but I don't believe there will be a sudden morning when the temperature you know, rises to a sky high uh, level and the, the um, Greenland ice melts you know, in a decade. Uh, and so I think that the collapses that we will see uh, over the next generation are local and regional. And you're absolutely right. Most scientists disagree with me on that score, uh, but I'm so old that I think I am right and they are wrong. Thank you very much for that. And I suggest Frederic Guarino, if you want to, I, I'll ask you to unmute and make, it, make your point sure. direct. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Professor, for a very clear-eyed uh, view. In essence, what I'm hearing when you were referencing the 200 uh, learned gentlemen who invented the welfare states in Norway, they did the same in other countries, you're calling for enlightenment. You're calling for an enlightened uh, uh, crop of leaders that we would you know, look to. Uh, do you think we have them in Europe? Do you think we have them in North America somewhere, in, in Asia, in Africa? I'm very cynical like you. I don't think so. I don't think we have any of these people, specifically because they're either bought and sold by people like the Cokes who spend on one election half a billion dollars, and it's going to continue. So what's the solution? <laughs> well, this is what I'm not supposed to say. You know, first well, please all, say it then. <laughs> First of all, I've spent 50 years of my life to try to create a better place, uh, and I have failed. So uh, this may be a small indication that it is not possible. That's uh, the, my first comment. On the other hand, uh, I do see that the Chinese have solved a large number of the problems that is bothering and will be bothering the world. Uh, they have first of all been able to solve the poverty problem of the Chinese. And since the Chinese represent, you know, the order of 20 to 25% of the world's population, you know, it, it, that's significant that they have been able to eight double the income of 1.4 billion people in 40 years. The problem about China is that most people don't like, or they believe they don't like the method that was used by the Chinese in order to, to uh, remove uh, poverty. And the second problem is that they don't believe, they don't trust the Chinese when they say that they're going to solve the climate problem next. And this is in spite of the fact that the Chinese already are producing the vast majority of the solar panels and the electric cars that are going to be a very central part of the solution. So uh, I am given hope by their behavior that it is possible for humanity to organize itself in a manner that uh, solves the problem. But I do fully accept that this is very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get in place in democratic, short-term, liberal market economies of the West. And so in that sense, I'm a deep pessimist, but I do at least see a hope, you know, a, a possibility. Uh, but I agree, many people would argue that that possibility is worse than just dying. Thank you very Thank you. much.
Thank uh, you. So I, I will ask two people from the audience to come over and ask a question, please. Can you introduce yourself and share? Uh, thank you, Professor Renders. Um, Joseph Hongsheng Zhao from the Department of Land Economy, a PhD candidate uh, of the University of Cambridge. Um, yeah, I, I would like to approach more from the uh, the aspect of your intellectual trajectories by focusing on one topic for 50 years, because it's very impressive to say that um, your pictures, like your photos, 50 years before, like at the age of 26 or something, because I believe most of the audience in the room of Cambridge, we are approximately at this kind of uh, uh, age. And you talk about the uh, stabilities in the past uh, 50 years, um, but I reckon there must be some differences in 50 years before and nowadays. For example, 50 years before, we won't be able to see your presentations like online, um, like you are here with us, I mean, most of the time. Uh, so I would say, uh, I would ask, do you think is it more difficult nowadays or by focusing on a grand topic like the limit to growth for the future 50 years for the new generation of young scholars? Thank you very much. That's a, a, a very good question. Uh, you know, is it easier today to gather uh, a political force around good than it was 50 years ago? On the surface, it looks like it because I can, as you say, address a large number of people in a short period of time. But that assumes that 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 is the bottleneck, you know, that the bottleneck is to get the message across. My fear is that the message has been sent and received very clearly over the last 50 years. It's only that the recipients don't like the message. You know, it has been very clear that we have been questioning growth, growth for a long, long time, physical growth to be precise, and that people don't like this they would like growth because it increases their income, it increases their spending, it increases uh, the tax revenue of the government, it increases the profits of business. And so, although they hear loud and clear that we are saying that this is going to lead to long-term problems, they don't care. And so uh, you're asking the question, is it easier to get attention in the current short-termist society than it was to gain get attention in the short-term society that existed 50 years ago? My answer is that I don't know. Uh, we are now trying, you know, the Earth for All project is very well funded on, not on the scientific part, which is my part. It is on the, building a global campaign part, which is now taking place. And you should go, all of you, to the Earth for All life website and join the campaign and see if we could actually get someone to do something about this. And let me then hasten to add that the important audience sits in the rich world. It is the rich world that ought to get something done, you know, that allows the poor world to grow very fast in labor productivity and consumption so that, you know, they reach decent levels while the rich rest of the world pays for this and also makes sure that the climate problem is solved. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So please, if you can introduce yourself and say a question. Yes, um, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Bettina Blumling from the University of Stavanger, and, and I'm so great. <laughs> Greetings from Cambridge. <laughs> I'm a visiting scholar here. Um, I would have two questions. Um, from my understanding, in your presentation, you emphasized several times that it is important to organize. So you, on the one hand, you said um, that well, there would be some implications if there were, was more on an authoritarian approach, if we only, um, and so policymakers cannot only be the ones who are responsible maybe to make a change. 
Um, and so my question to you would be, how would you consider what kind of organization, how to organize, uh, how should um, the population organize? And with um, in that regard, in particular, I would like to ask you, you have first presented two happy scenarios and then six scenarios. And so I was wondering if you could tell us which four scenarios you left out um, in the first uh, presentation that was displayed. And in how far in these four scenarios that you left out, maybe um, this organization, uh, organization of population of the population um, differed. So, um, so in how far then could your models show that different kinds of organization have different impact um, on the happiness um, of the overall um, development, societal development? And then in this regard, a second question would be um, that you showed that GDP growth continued into the future, but it has an impact. One could say that the focus on GDP, because it does not in, uh, consider uh, inequality, as an indicator. So the focus of GDP as an indicator is actually the problem. So could you could you give um, us an idea of why there has been consistent focus on the GDP as an indicator while there have been changes in the development that show that most likely GDP does not actually validly represent what we should be focusing on? Um, as, you, as you showed, uh, GDP growth went up, but well-being and inequality uh, went down and one could say this is because we have been focusing too much also on an indicator. So the first question uh, is on the, uh, on the issue of what can one do as an individual or as a group? My statement is basically that it requires collective action. It is not enough with individual voluntary action to save uh, the world, that yeah. is to implement the five <clears throat> turnarounds. And then the question is, how do you then organize in order to get the five turnarounds in place? And the simplest way to do it is, of course, the old fashioned unionization, you know, that at least you start to strengthen, to organize in labor unions in order to redress some of the national inequity that currently exists simply by increasing the wage level uh, for the uh, lowest uh, half of, of the population. The second thing you need to do is of course to organize uh, in the various environmental movements, the women's movements, the inequality movements, the movements that actually try to push for the solutions. But all of this gets very impractical uh, because you need to be a member of so many groups that in the real world, the simplest thing to do is to vote for the correct party. That leads, of course, to the problem that no correct party exists, you know, one that actually focuses on the five TAs. So then form the party. You know, start the political work of getting this thing into a platform. And that is, of course, what the, the Earth for All campaign uh, is uh, going to do. Second note uh, on the difference between using the GDP uh, as a su success indicator or the well being index as a success uh, indicator. Uh, it is, you are right that we. The, the Western world has used the GDP per person, the value of the, the annual production of goods and services divided by the population as the success uh, goal, as a success, as the performance indicator over the last 50 years. And uh, you see what has happened as a consequence. We, ha we have a society which is focused on increasing the GDP. This has led to a number of problems, namely rising temperatures, rising inequality. And so we are arguing that you should rather try to maximize well-being, which compose both of GDP and income and public spending and the environmental damage and the inequality. And as you saw from our graphs, in the too little, too late scenario, you know, the GDP per person is continuing up because technology and labor 
productivity is going to continue going up, but at the same time, you see well-being declining. So the two of them don't move in the right direction. Uh, and it is our argument that you should look at the well-being effect of organizing society the way you currently do it, uh, and then see that it is declining, which is an encouragement for changing the way in which we run our economies uh, so that we maximize well-being instead of maximizing GDP. And how do you do that? You do this by focusing on the five turnarounds. And you don't ask the question whether those turnarounds increase or decrease the GDP. You just see to that you remove poverty in the poor world, that you, uh, uh, okay, that you produce food in a manner that does not destroy biodiversity, that you produce electricity energy by not using coal, oil, and gas, that you see to that there are rights for women, and that you see to as a prime goal, not as a tricky down thing, that inequality is reduced, which means transfers from the rich to the poor. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Professor Randers, thanks so much for um, thanks so much for speaking. Um, my name is Jonah Messinger. I'm a PhD student here studying physics. And then I also have an affiliation with the Breakthrough Institute, which is an environmental think tank in Berkeley, California. Um, I sort of have three things to say. Um, I, guess, I guess to your point about um, sort of being able to make uh, predictions and accurate, pre precise predictions uh, well into the future, I think in certain situations, um, that's true. Uh, like your graph, uh, GN, GNI per capita versus uh, energy use per, or energy use per capita versus GNI per capita, and that's very well understood. Um, but don't you think that extending something like that uh, a, a fig like a, a figure like that, that conclusion from a figure like that to a whole model. I think I would actually argue that it's a, a, a little bit serves to sort of make, sort of justify unfalsifiable claims. If the societal collapse doesn't come or the regional collapse doesn't come in 10 years, well, it can always come in 20 years or 30 years. Um, and in particular, sort of the second point that I'd like to make is, you know, I would actually say that some of the fundamental modeling in the limits to growth modeling, at least certainly from the first book, I haven't read some of the later books, um, are based off of based off of data, and primarily I'm speaking about population dynamics that are actually inconsistent with the empirical data. Um, so for example, in the limits to growth book, um, you and your colleagues correctly plot, I think it's actually in figure 31, uh, population dynamics, uh, GNI per capita, versus birth rates. And you show that consistent with across regions and societies and cultures, that as countries get richer, the birth rate comes down. But that's actually not what's fed into the model. Instead, there's a social science paper that you all cite, where there's a survey of 17 countries and 16 out of the 17 countries, and, and the survey question asks what's their desired birth rate, not what's the actual birth rate, what's their desired number of children. And then when you plot that, 16 out of the 17 data points are in alignment with that empirical data that you showed in the figure prior. But then there's a 17th one way out to the far end of the GNI per capita scheme where it actually picks up. And then you basically, the model then predicts that as countries get richer, eventually actually birth rates go up. And I, my question is, is that, does that population dynamic, which is inconsistent with the empirical data that even you all show in, in limits to growth, is that not what drives these societal collapses? And then the third thing is, I think it's a little bit uncomfortable and, and actually I think sort of outrageous and maybe even hubristic to sort of just claim that environmental and climate challenges can't be tackled in a democratic system. Um, and it's funny because if you look at China, the emissions are going up, whereas in EU and, and, and in the United States, they're going down and it's not because of exporting industry, the consumption and production based cons uh, emissions uh, rates for both the United States and the EU um, are quite coupled and are going down. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know, Jorgen, if you can say something about this last question. Uh, so thank you, uh, fellow physicist, for um, uh, starting to ask interesting uh, questions that pertains to the detail. Uh, um, I guess the, 
one of the reasons uh, why I have survived so long in this uh, uh, discussion, in, in this uh, debate, is that we're trying to hold our eyes steady on what is important and what is actually going on and, and uh, uh, what are the uh, reasons why things are going on. And so we try to avoid getting into the detail. And I preface this because now I'm going to go into the detail and just illustrate to other people that at once when we do that, we lose the baby with the bathwater. So first of all, on uh, your allegation, which I take very seriously, uh, that we are not, you know, reflecting uh, empirical data, that's wrong. You know, we are reflecting empirical data to the extent that we are able to do so. You're talking, uh, you're talking as if empirical data are always totally consistent and not contradictory. Normal data is contradictory, fussy, imprecise, etc. So that's, uh, so, you know, so we are doing as well as we can. Concerning that one outlier point, which you, if I under remember and or understand correctly, uh, this is the one data point that showed that women in the suburbs of the United States in 1970, while they had still had yet not started to have um, jobs, actually had a higher number of children than you know the rest of the population. That data point is there, but. I do not think, and I know that in all the, the last 40 years of this, you know, the relationship between the number of children per woman during her reproductive life uh, time has been going down monotonically as a consequence of, of income. And that this is also a phenomenon that has been observed in the 10 regions that we are now using as the database for the, the modern models. So, uh, and clearly, you know, the population collapses that occur, you had a snipe, you know, in, in one of your sentences where you're saying that the collapse is due to that one data point, which shows higher population growth at a very high income, that would lead to the opposite. It would not lead to a collapse in the population. It would lead to an expansion of the population. So uh, on the second thing that democracies uh, will not uh, handle uh, the issue well, where you are, <laughs> where your answer is that, that uh, the Chinese uh, don't do it either. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right that short-term um, systems, systems of governance that is influenced by short-term voters or short-term businesses or short-term politicians will not handle long-term uh, issues. And so uh, it is, and so uh, Russia, you know, the Soviet Union responded as slowly uh, as did the, the, the Western democracies, you know, to the pollution uh, emissions uh, in the uh, 1970s and uh, in the 1980s. Uh, I think you're wrong on, on the cuts that the Chinese are doing in their emissions. You know, they will reach a peak in their emissions in 2030. Uh, they are at a much lower GDP per person than we were at the time when, when uh, they are starting to reduce their emissions. So I still think it remains to be seen, you know, whether uh, an authoritarian regime that has the proper goal, namely point one, to give a decent income to most of their people, point two, to get rid of inequalities, and point three, to stabilize uh, or to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2060, whether they will succeed better than the West. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Professor Randers. Uh, the, I think the discussion is very rich. A lot of questions, so much to say. And there is much more here that I want to bring along, but I'm afraid we don't have any more time. But uh, in practice here, there's a lot to say. For example, there is this, this thing of the shareholders. So Patagonia, assuming a fraction population become a shareholder for the rich. On the other hand, there is, you know, uh, Bill Gates that in 10 years, he did much more on malaria than how the government did in 100. That's yeah. another comment. Was I, put. I, I think that all those concrete things, uh, they should answer one question. You know, what the world needs to get done is not profitable from the investor point of view. That's the basic problem. So it means that businesses that are for profit can't solve those problems and will not solve them. You see the way the rich people do it is they first make money in something that is dirty or polluting and then they use the, pro the money to solve the problem. Uh, and this is also the, the second generalization that the problems that we need to solve are long-term. You know, the good thing comes 30 years after the cost. And that's the reason why short-term systems of governance do not really have a chance. Uh, so the problem is the short-term nature of the human being in my mind, it, which is institutionalized in democracy and the market. And so we do certainly have a problem. Okay, thank you very much. So I think with these last words, we need to conclude this seminar. So next week, we're going to have Gaia Errington. So don't miss her. Uh, she's going to be really a very good talk. She's going to pick up from information from Jorgen today and uh, open up. She wrote a new book called Five Insights for Avoiding Global Collapse, <laughs> which is, just came out this month. So uh, a lot of stuff in there. And uh, you will love that, I can tell you. Uh, and uh, again, Professor Randers, Thank you very much. So much discussion. And, you know, maybe we can find a way to invite you again next week or two weeks time to keep going with the conversation. It is, of course, much simpler that you read the book. After all, the Earth for All book is out. <laughs> and, yeah. and, or, or you just go on the earthforall.life website and look, follow the discussion and read all the stuff which is written there. There are hundreds and hundreds of pages behind what I have been saying. Okay, fantastic. So I, at this point, I, I'd like to thank everybody, everybody helping. And uh, thank you, Professor Randers, for your support. People are clapping from, from the you. seminar series. I think people are also happy from online, still 50 plus people. So really, thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll be back, okay? Thank you. Thank you.